how to knit a sweater for beginners. Hi everyone, Norman here. Today we are going to knit this raglan sweater together. This will be a very long tutorial that took me well over a hundred hours to create because I wanted to include all these little tips and tricks along the way that make all the difference. Because here's the thing, knitting such a raglan sweater is actually easy. However, it's just as easy to create way too much fabric here underneath the arms and it bunches out or you create unsightly holes here along your decrease line or where you close the armpits or just as common, you fail to raise the neck enough and then your collar constantly slides down towards your back. And I am here to help you prevent all these mistakes and so much more. Let's dive right into it and show you how to knit an easy raglan sweater. First of all, I also wanted to show you how things look or this sweater looks when I'm sitting. As you can see, I can raise my arms, roll around with my shoulder and there is no excess fabric here that bunches out in the chest area. That's because I calculated these Ruckland decreases the right way and I'm going to show you exactly how to do that because that's another common issue for Ruckland sweaters. It looks all nice and neat when you're standing and then you sit down and suddenly things look very wonky and there's just too much fabric. This tutorial also comes with a pattern. It's available on my blog. It's the first link in the description below. Download it now. Part of this tutorial are also some essential preparations, measurements and calculations. Use the chapter function to navigate around, but I implore you to not skip them and listen carefully because this is where most beginners fail. And in fact, that is the most important part of this tutorial and not knitting stock in its stitch. Now, which yarn is best for knitting a sweater? You can basically knit a sweater with about just any yarn on this planet. As a beginner, you might want to pick something between DK weight and worsted weight yarn. So roughly between needle size three, five, six. That's the range you should be operating. If you go below and knit a sweater with fingering weight, well, it will take forever. Whereas if you use chunkier qualities, it will be very harsh on your hands. Plus you will create a fabric that is very stiff and very warm. And that's typically not very comfortable in most climates. Now I will be using a, a blend between Merino yarn and Yak yarn by Pasquale. This yarn is rather expensive, but I'm also a more advanced knitter. Merino yarn can typically be a great choice and it's typically very affordable. If you want your sweater to be a little bit easier to care for, then pick a nice superwash yarn, possibly with a blend uh, with nylon or a uh, Acrylic. I wouldn't pick pure nylon or acrylic yarn because it typically does not create a fabric that is breathable enough for most climates. Now when in doubt I would pick a nice sheep wool yarn. This pattern here, your first sweater is very plain. All this stockinette stitch uh, is perfect for using a nice colorway in bold colors with a short color change. This will be, um, the stockinette stitch will showcase a colorway like these ones here very, very perfectly. Now, as you can see, I knitted uh, the color in a contrasting uh, yarn. That's entirely up to you, you don't have to do that. But you could also even join in a third color and knit stripes that won't change the pattern, but could look a little bit more interesting. Other than yarn, you will also need circular knitting needles. Uh, I am using these 3.5 millimeter knitting needles by Knitter's Pride and I have some three millimeter tips, uh, short tips to do the ribbing and then I have four cables to put stitches on hold, but you can use any other stitch holding system of your choice as well. And then you need a reliable tape measure, a tapestry needle, scissors, and some stitch markers. Part one, swatching and calculating your size. Let me be very clear, I am no big fan of swatching. They are unreliable by nature, they are annoying and a waste of yarn and if you want to knit a sweater that truly fits, there is absolutely no way around knitting one. 
If you skip the next couple of minutes, I can guarantee you that in 99% of all cases, your sweater will not fit perfectly. It can be a bit tedious, I know, and complicated. Take your time, comment if you have any questions, but do not skip this part. Step number one, knit a swatch. So I've cast on 26 stitches here and I've knitted across 30 rows. I used a stretchy cast on and a stretchy bind off. It might not be very pretty, but otherwise a bind off or a cast on that is not stretchy might actually cinch the fabric here below or at the top. And this might uh, influence the way the fabric behaves and ultimately the kind of gauge you will be able to measure. I also did not break the yarn. I might want to use the yarn later on in case I need it. This little swatch here serves just one purpose. We'll use it to calculate our cast on and get a general feel for the fabric. We'll be using the actual work in progress to confirm the rest of our calculations. This is, if you ask me, a lot more reliable than a swatch and the reason why I prefer knitting bottom up. Once you finish your swatch, take a close look at it. Check the stitch definition, stretch it out a bit and then decide for yourself if this is the kind of gauge you want to embellish your fabric with. So what do I mean? So here, this yarn here comes with uh, needle recommendations and here on the labels it says 4 to 4.5 millimeter needles, that's US size 6 to 7. So I've knitted my first swatch using those four millimeter needles and I really didn't like it. When I stretched it out, I could see, uh, you know, skin peeking through the little holes between the stitches. So I unraveled the swatch and cast on another swatch using these uh, 3.5 millimeter needles. And now it's something I really like. And that is the first and probably most information, uh, most important information your swatch will be able to tell you. Is this the kind of fabric you want to create for your sweater? I can't tell it to you, only your swatch. And it's really just a personal preference. Step number two, we need to measure our swatch. So I have a really good ruler here. Here is my swatch and I'm just placing it here on my tabletop. The edges are curling in a little bit. I'm trying to fix this here, but I'm not stretching the, fa I'm specifically not stretching the fabric out. And then here, right at the bottom, I want you to count 15 stitches. So my zero mark is here, and then I'm going to count out 15 stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So 15 stitches are 6.2 centimeters um, wide. And then I want you to move your ruler up a little bit to a different position. Again, put uh, the zero right at the beginning of a stitch and then count out another uh, 15 stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Here I see 6.5 centimeters for these 15 stitches. And I want you to note uh, down these two uh, numbers. So we had 6.7 uh, centimeters and 6.5 centimeters. Next, I want you to do the exact same thing horizontally. So again, here I start right at the beginning or at the end of a stitch and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that is about 4.8. Then let's do the exact same thing over here on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we have well, that's 4.6.
So uh, you need to note down these two numbers as well, 4.6 and the other was 4.8 centimeters. Now you might be wondering, well, Norman, why did we measure in two places? Well, that's easy. As you knit your swatch, you might actually ease up. And when you measure, you might stretch or overstretch your fabric a tiny little bit. And by taking multiple measurements, you kind of avoid these kind of errors. So uh, you would actually have to create the mean value. So we recorded 6.7 centimeters and 6.5 centimeters for our stitch gauge. The mean value would be 6.6 .6 centimeters. And for our row gauge, the mean value would be 4.7 centimeters. Those are the numbers we will be using for our calculation. Now, you might be wondering, well, Norman, why on earth are you measuring stitches and not four inches like every other pattern on this planet? Well, to be quite honest with you, a stitch has very clear and defined boundaries. There is the left leg and there is the right leg. If you measure four inches, you will always end up ignoring fractional stitches. God didn't make it so that your stitches always magically fit full numbered into squares of two or four inches. Setting aside that four inches are not 10 centimeters yet, 90% of all patterns on Ravelry treated as such. If there was a single thing I could change about the way we compile knitting patterns, then this would be it. My personal opinion, if you use such a gauge toy, you might as well stop trying. It's just wrong. Next, I want you to wash your swatch. Add mild soap and then let it soak in lukewarm water for around 30 minutes. This step is quite vital because you probably plan to wash your finished sweater as well. And sometimes uh, fibers stretch out dramatically after washing. And this step is to avoid any unpleasant surprises. Next, block your swatch, but avoid overstretching. Just stretch it far enough that you end up with a nice and pleasing stitch definition and then pin things into place and let it dry. You won't overstretch your finished sweater either, so try to replicate this process. Some people will actually weigh down the swatch and let it hang overnight. So I attach some stitch markers here to the bottom. Then I can pull through a knitting needle. This knitting needle will help to distribute the weight evenly. And then I can attach a little weight here to the knitting needle. Nothing heavy. So, you know, like a pen like this will totally suffice. And then you can let it hang overnight. And this is to simulate the kind of weight that is pulling down on your shoulders. Because some yarns can stretch out dramatically, especially typically loosely spun yarns with not a lot of crimp, so like alpaca or so. And then imagine you are knitting a sweater in 2XL or so, and then there's 200, 300 or 400 grams of fabric pulling on your shoulder seams or just on your shoulder or your neckline and uh, that can stretch out the fabric dramatically and this is to prevent any uh, unpleasant surprises. Once completely dry, I want you to measure your swatch one more time. Again, count 15 stitches horizontally in two different places and 15 rows vertically in another two different spots and then calculate the mean value for both. And then you can simply work out the percentage change between the, uh, these measurements and your prior measurements. And this here will be your blocking ease. This will give you a good inkling how your sweater will stretch out after washing and blocking. Next, you have to measure your chest or bust at its widest point. It's very, very important that you wear underneath whatever you plan to wear underneath your sweater later on as well. So a t-shirt, a bra, shapewear, whatever. Please do wear that as well because it will require room as well. Since measurements are a little bit difficult to obtain on yourself, definitely consider asking your partner, a friend or a fellow crafter to help you out. So you can ensure that the, uh, the tape will be level. At the very least, you should do it in front of a mirror. 
So just to make sure it's this measurement we need here, my chest at its widest point. Again, make sure that the tape is level all around and then note there down that number. Now measuring is actually the easy part. What you also need to do is you need to define the kind of positive ease you are looking for. Do you want this body hugging? Then don't add anything to that number. For a standard fit, I'd roll uh, with around 5% of positive ease. So that's the fabric you add on top of it. So here for this t-shirt, you can see there is positive ease. So this here would be um, body hugging and all this fabric here, this extra fabric is my positive ease. And for a, so 5% for a very f standard fit and around 10 to 15%. 15% uh, if you want a comfortably uh, loose fit. Typically the bigger you are the more positive ease looks better. So say you measured 100 centimeters or 40 inches then simply add 5 or 10%. How much exactly will definitely depend on your preferences. It's nothing I can tell you. So it might be a little bit easier to find a sweater that you feel fits nice. You can also use a t-shirt since you probably have to measure it flat so you can't really measure it in the round. You'd have to uh, multiply the front measurement times two and then add a centimeter or maybe a third of an inch. It depends a little bit on what you are measuring because obviously you cannot measure the actual fold line. So this will also take a little bit of, uh, well, like I said, a centimeter, two centimeters, a third of an inch, two third of an inch, and you need to add that on top of that. So in my case, uh, my chest measurement here is 93.5 centimeters and I added around 5% of positive ease so I roll with 98 centimeters. The next bit is super easy. So we know the circumference of our chest and we know how many centimeters we need to cover 15 stitches. So simply divide 15 stitches by uh, those 7.4.5 centimeters um, we measured and this will be your actual stitch gauge. So you need two point, well, one stitches per centimeter. And then just multiply that number. So 2.1 uh, stitches per centimeter in my case times your, uh, uh, so the circumference of your chest. So 98 centimeters in my case, and that's 197 stitches. That is how many stitches you need to cast on. There's just one little note here. So I will be knitting the hem here in a two by one rib stitch. This means my cast on needs to be divisible by three, 197 isn't divisible by three, so I need to round to the next number divisible by three. That would be 198 stitches. If you don't like the two by one rib stitch and prefer a two by two rib stitch, well, then round to the next number divisible by four. That would be 196 stitches. You could also do a one by one rib stitch. There are no hard rules here. Just do what you prefer. I just feel the two by one rib stitch often looks the neatest. Okay, so we're ready to cast on and I will need to cast on 198 stitches and I will do an alternating in pattern cast on. I already set out 10 stitch markers because it's so easy to lose track and uh, by placing a stitch marker every 20 or rather 21 stitches in my case, I uh, will never lose track and if I do it's easy to catch up. I also switch to three millimeter needles so I want my ribbing and my hem to be tight. If you don't want that maybe because you are knitting a larger size then don't but I uh, will switch to three millimeter needles and I will knit the rest of my sweater using the 3.5 millimeter needles. And then I will start my cast on with a simple twisted loop again. Just a simple twisted loop. 
This already counts as my first stitch and then I will cast on one more stitch knitwise followed by one stitch purlwise. And I will from here on I will count to 21. So that's three, four, five, six. And each number divisible by three uh, gets a purl stitch. So seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Remember to let your tail balance out a little bit after every couple of stitches. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Let the tail uh, balance itself out, place a stitch marker, and then I start the process all over again. And I will cast on 1980 stitch total plus one. I will need the extra stitch to join in the round and I'll see you there. Okay, and now it's time to join things in the round. So I will slip here this first stitch over to the other needle and then pass this last stitch over. This was our additional stitch, then pull on the tail and then I can start knitting across in my two by two rib stitch, a uh, two by one rib stitch, sorry, pattern. Here in the very first uh, row, I will go very slowly, making sure to count out loud in my head because it can be fairly easy to mess up the repeat. You can kind of see the little pearl bumps here below, but ah, uh, yeah, it can be a bit tricky. So I am going super slowly. And then I will knit all together around five centimeters of ribbing from here. Oh, and of course here, I will discard my stitch markers as I go. However, I know that between all these uh, stitch markers are always 21 stitches. So I always need to end with a purl stitch before uh, I remove the stitch marker. So that's kind of an easy way to check whether you messed up your ribbing repeat or not. Anyway, I'll see you once I finish the ribbing. As I approach my third round, I wanted to add two little reminders. So first of all, you may elect to place a little um, beginning of the round stitch marker here. However, uh, you don't really need the stitch marker and you can just use the tail as orientation. And the second thing is, so here in your third round or after your third round, your uh, cast on will be a lot more stable and you really should use uh, this opportunity to check the, you know, whether you accidentally twisted your cast on or not. It's sometimes a little bit deceiving in the first or uh, first two rounds, but after three rounds, you can definitely see whether you did or not. And secondly, so for example, I noticed that the 20, uh, the, the 50 centimeter cables were a little bit cumbersome. So I switched to much smaller cables. So uh, the cables don't even need to be even close remotely um, as long as the circumference of your body. They can be a lot shorter. Uh, you can then you can really bunch up stitches here and transport them a lot easier. And if the cable is uh, too long, that's sometimes a little bit more difficult to do. So do keep that in mind. You can always uh, switch cables. So I finished around five centimeters of ribbing. For me, that was a 17 uh, rows or 16, between 16 and 17. And now it's time to start knitting the torso. I will actually change colors here and continue with this yarn. 
Now here's one last little option I want to address. Some people want the torso to be slightly wider and looser than the hem and thus you would add increases. So uh, normally I would just start knitting. If I was just knitting in one color, I would just start knitting across in stock and knit stitch and then I would scatter around KLL's knit left loop here as I go. Problem is if you change colors that is bound to be very visible. So if you want to change colors then I propose hiding the increases here in between those purl ridges. So I would purl one stitch here and then add a PLL purl left loop like this and then uh, continue ribbing and after I don't know it depends on, on how many such increases you want to place four eight and scatter them all the way around so, so just one more time I wouldn't actually uh, um, put them that close together and then lift this loop here and purl it. You absolutely don't have to increase here in this round and there are certain body types where this certainly doesn't look very pleasing. So if some, for example is people with a bigger belly or pregnant people things like that. So I typically wouldn't go for this kind of balloonish look but if you're very skinny and slender it sometimes can add a little bit of well substance to your uh, fabric so I will actually place eight increases here in this round for me personally but know that it will end up a little bit well oversize is maybe a too strong a word and so I will place my uh, purl left loops here all the way around eight purl left loops all scattered around my pattern and then I will switch colors in the next round. So after this one increase round it's time to switch needle sizes for me. If you went down a needle size for the ribbing then you would have to switch needle sizes as well. This is of course entirely optional you don't have to do it. For some it makes the ribbing a little bit neater and of course it also makes the hem a little bit tighter. So definitely consider that. And now it's time to switch yarns. So I will just break my yarn. You don't need to leave a long tail here. And then I will uh, join in my new color. You can uh, join in the new color any way you like. So I typically like to prefer the uh, twist and weave method, which is fairly easy. So I do it like this. I have a full video on this method. Um, I'll link it to you in the pattern. The first time you are seeing this, uh, you probably will go like, what? Well, anyway, and then you just knit across in stock and knit stitch. What you can do is you can also weave in then old tail right away. So when I'm knitting stripes I typically don't weave in the new tail in right away because that can sometimes kind of peek through and be a little bit visible. I don't also weave in both tails at the same time because that uh, can create a little bit of uh, well, bulkiness that pushes stitches to the foreground. I don't want this either. So I'm just weaving in the old tail. And then in the next round, I will uh, weave in the new tail. I kind of stagger it. And then you just knit across in a plain stock knit stitch. And here, as you can see, these increases are super super invisible and neat. So I'll just knit across in stock and knit stitch here uh, for one round. 
So I am about to finish this very, very first round of stock and it stitch. And now there are two things you need or can do um, to improve your sweater. So first of all, if you changed colors here, you might want to uh, avoid or hide the jog. So I lift this leg here back to the knitting needle and then I knit it together with the next stitch. This will, well, hide the jog. And then, as I said, now it's time to weave in the other tail one at a time, as I said before. And that way you don't need to weave in ends later on. And then from here, I want you to continue in stockinette stitch for another five centimeters. So knit another five centimeters across and I'll see you there. Okay, so I finished knitting across those five centimeters in stockinette stitch and now would be the perfect time to try on your sweater in the making the very first time. So transfer your stitches to a circular knitting needle with a longer cable. If you are knitting a sweater in a bigger size, remember that you can use these little connectors to attach two cables uh, and uh, create a longer cable. Or you could also thread a, a, some scrap yarn on a tapestry needle and uh, pick up your stitches like that. Now, when you try on your sweater, remember two things. So first of all, the reason why I'm telling you to try it on now and not may, you know, I could have told you to try it on right after the hem as well, but knitting behaves dramatically different if you have just three rows or rounds on your needle or well, 30. Uh, knitting is stretchy, so in many ways it behaves a bit like a rubber band. It's fairly easy to stretch out one rubber band. But if I have two rubber bands on my fingers, it's a lot harder. And if I have three, even harder yet. Knitting is stretchy and it works a bit like a rubber band. And secondly, do remember your, uh, sorry, your swatch and how that behaved after uh, blocking and washing. So when you try on your sweater, always remind yourself, well, this is going to stretch out by another three, five, ten percent, whatever you noted and whatever you calculated. Now I'll assume your sweater fits and here's another thing I want you to consider. So almost all interchangeable knitting needle sets and a lot of circular knitting needles have this little hole here at the very end of their needles. And you can use this hole to insert a lifeline. So I'm using a standard fishing line here and then just pull it through and then as I knit along, as I knit along, I can carry this fishing line along and this will insert a little lifeline into your fabric. And uh, first of all, that is very, very, a very smart thing if you need to unravel. So uh, you can always uh, unravel and let me show you. So I can just pull this through. And then I have here this little, well, it's very difficult to see for you. Maybe you can see. So I have this little lifeline here and I can always uh, unravel to rip things out and my project won't unravel any further. So that's very, very smart. But there's another very important reason why I'm telling you to insert a lifeline here right at this point. So sometimes, and this happens remarkably often, sometimes knitted fabric, especially sweater, there's a lot of fabric uh, up here. It stretches, stretches out dramatically after washing. So you end up with a sweater that is way too long. If you have a lifeline here, you can just cut later on. You can use a pair of scissors, cut away this portion of your sweater, then pick up the stitches from your lifeline with a knitting needle and then knit in the other direction and immediately attach your hem. So you can easily shorten 
your sweater lady later on without much hassle. Do consider this, just an option. Either way, from here on, I want you to continue knitting across in plain stock knit stitch until you are around, well, four inches or 10 centimeters roughly below your armpit. And then we will talk about uh, how to knit and attach the arms, how to calculate your raglan decreases, your neckline and so on. But for now it's a smooth sailing and you just knit across in stockinette stitch. So I've made some good progress in the past hour. Here is my lifeline. You can see how it's pushing the right legs of these stitches a little bit to the foreground. That's nothing to worry about. Uh, it's going to even itself out once you remove the lifeline. I'm actually going to remove the lifeline now because I won't need it. However, if you feel well, Okay, there's a chance that my sweater might uh, end up too long. Keep it in the fabric and if you're worried that you're making multiple mistakes, well, you, nothing prevents you from adding uh, another lifeline a couple of rows further up. Now, there's another thing I want to show you. So, as I've been uh, merrily uh, knitting along, I ran across one of these unwelcome little guests uh, are not in my skein and if you knit a sweater there chances are pretty high that you run across one of these. Never keep them. Break the yarn. So that's what I'm going to do now. Break the yarn. I'm gonna cut away the knot and now we need to join in the yarn properly because knots can unravel and that's nothing you want in your fabric and the knot might push to the foreground as well and then it's going to be very visible. What I want you to do is here at the position because this is just this is just one big round it's there is no true uh, front or back or so. So what I want you to do is or rather consider doing is place a little stitch marker here just below and define this spot as the place where you will later attach the arms. So all your join and then whenever you need to change or join in a new ball, you do it exactly in this position or roughly in this position. So your joints are going to be hidden underneath the arm. That's the least visible position in your sweater. And even if you use the most invisible way to join in a new yarn, it's always a tiny little bit uh, visible and you know, why not just uh, hide it under the arm? Now I already showed you one way to change colors or join in a new yarn. Here's another. So this is a two ply yarn and I'm going to separate these plies here. And then I'm going to cut away one. And I'm going to do the exact same, or well, I already did the exact same thing here on the left side. And then I'm going to do something like the Russian join, only without a tapestry needle. This here is a feltable yarn, it's 80% sheep wool, so I can just wet this a little bit with my spit or you can also use a little bit of water and then you can felt this end of the yarn together and then you can do the exact same thing here on the other end. Felt it together by adding a little soft spit and then rubbing things together and then you have a fairly, sorry, uh, then you have a fairly invisible uh, joint. It's going to be very durable because as I knit along, things are going to be set into place automatically. I mean, this part here of the yarn isn't uh, twisted. So that's going to be slightly visible. You could try to twist it before felting. But um, so this is really a mixture between the Russian 
uh, join and the spit splice or felted join or however you want to call it. However, it's going to be very, very invisible and yet very, very uh, durable. Anyway, um, I'm going to continue knitting again. I want you to stop right, uh, well, around uh, four inches or 10 centimeters below your armpit. So as you can see, I made some um, good progress here and my knitting almost reaches up to my armpits. And I want you to stop when your sweater in the making is around 10 centimeters or roughly four inches below yours. As you might be able to see, I also already blocked my work in progress because I want to make sure it fits 100%. If you are a beginner and this is your first time knitting a sweater, I definitely recommend doing the same. I'll show you how to block the finished sweater at the very end of this video. So this is going to be the exact same process with the only difference that you keep the yarn attached, just place it beside on the side of your sink and later your blocking mat and you will be fine. If at this point you notice that things are either way too big or you know a little bit too tight for comfort you would have to take notes and unravel things. The other option would be uh, to turn this into a cardigan and stick it here along the middle but that of course would be a different video and maybe even more complicated. Remember how I said I really prefer knitting sweaters bottom up because it's just so much easier to determine the fit. Well, here's why. We have a huge, huge, huge swatch here and it's knitted in the round with your actual tension and your actual gauge. So there are no artificial swatching conditions and it's already blocked in my case and I know it fits the way it should. So first, I want you to obtain your row and stitch gauge one more time. Measure 20 or even 30 stitches at this time. You have a big, 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 big swatch and the more stitches you measure, the more accurate your gauge will be. So measure 20 or 30 stitches in multiple places and do the same for your row gauge. Measure 30 rows in multiple places. And then you simply recalculate your gauge. So uh, in this case, 30 stitches divided by the mean value, that's 14.4 uh, centimeter. And that's roughly 2.1 stitches per centimeter. This here is my new uh, stitch gauge and I'm going to use it for the rest of our calculations, regardless of what we worked um, out before. And so this will be the new stitch gauge. Now there's one note and of course you have to do the exact same with your row gauge. Now there's one note here. If you haven't uh, blocked your work in progress, yet or don't plan to, then you would have to apply your blocking uh, ease to that number. So you would have to take these 2.1 stitches per centimeter and then multiply it times your blocking ease. So in my case, my swatch stretched out by 30% after blocking. So uh, my new stitch gauge, my actual new stitch gauge would 2.37 centimeters um, yeah, stitches per centimeter. So that's what you would have to do if you didn't block your work in progress. Then you would have to um, apply your blocking ease. And lastly, I also want you to stretch out your work in progress to the max in one spot. So insert a blocking mat and then use pins and stretch things out as far as possible. Now, please, 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 no brute force here, just stretch out things as far as possible. And then measure 20 stitches vertical in a couple of different spots as well. Note down the mean value. Just like before, divide these two numbers, so 15 stitches divided by um, 9.7 centimeters, that's roughly 1.5.5 as stitches per centimeters. This here, 
will be your negative ease or rather your negative ease gauge. So the actual negative ease would be if you worked out the percentage between your normal gauge and this negative each gauge. However, we don't need it nor do I think it makes any sense. However, we need this number here to counter check whether you can fit your head through your color or your hands through your cuffs and so on. Now comes the probably most important but also maybe most difficult part of knitting a sweater, measuring with a reliable tape. As you can see, I'm already wearing the finished sweater. I recorded this after I finished knitting. So this will give you the opportunity to see this sweater and the fit, uh, you know, a little bit more closely. From here, you really have two choices. You need to, well, we need to measure the upper torso. And this is sadly nothing you can do yourself with precision because we also need to measure here in the back. So you do need a fellow crafter or your partner or whoever to help you along. If you are a beginner and you have a more or less standard body, so this means there are no limbs missing, you don't have a big, big hump or something like that, and you do own a raglan sweater that you feel fits well, then you can also measure that for a beginner. That might be a little bit easier, but I'm going to show you how to measure properly with the help of my little body here. Before we can even start measuring, you need to define the fit of your sweater. So first of all, you may want to readjust your hip or seat line because now you have your actual work in progress to work with. Put it on, I mean, yours is just reaching to uh, this point, but it will work regardless. And then I recommend putting on some pants. The pants you are most likely to wear your sweater with, or skirt, jeans, whatever you intend to wear uh, with, along with your sweater. Put that on and then toy around. Most people actually want the hem of the, 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 the hem to cover the waistline of those pants. But some people also want the belt to show, some even like a midriff bearing top, or maybe you want to the sweater to cover your tie. So, so how much and how far, that's nothing I can tell you. That is up to you and your preferences. And then once you decided on a hip or seat line, take some pins and mark that very spot. Do it here in the front, but more importantly, do it here in the back. Then you also need to define the kind of collar you want. Do you want a crew neck, more like a V neck or, you know, a big kind of uh, a boat neck? That's something you need to define for yourself as well. And then use some pins and mark the spot here in front where your collar ends or starts and here in the back. Mark these two spots. And while we're at it, you also need to define the length of your sleeves. So typically sweaters end or start right here at the wrist, but maybe you have different plans. Maybe you want a cropped sweater, maybe you want um, the, the cuffs to cover your uh, hands a little bit. That's up to you, but you need to mark that spot as well. The first and probably most important measurement we need is the so-called sky depth. So that's here on the back, right from your collar down to the middle of your shoulder plates. Blades. That is sadly a measurement that is a little bit more difficult to obtain. So you need a long strip of paper and then just clench the long strip of paper underneath your armpit and wrap it around your back. So I'm going to do this here as well, but I need some pins because sadly my dummy here won't play along. Uh, so use some pins, make sure, make sure that it's all level. And then we can measure this distance here with our tape. So right here from the collar down to the middle. Make sure that the tape here is uh, straight and then note down that number that is your sky depth. And while we're here on the back, we also need your hip depth. So start here right at the pin that marks your collar and go all the way down to the second pin down that marks your seat line and note down that measurement as well. That's your hip depth. You will also need the so-called sky width. So basically, 
that is this little measurement here whatever is covered by your immediate arms right underneath your armpit also a little bit more difficult to obtain so here's a little trick if you have a long straight knitting needle just put it underneath your arm and then Go in and mark the spot here on either side with a pencil or something else you can easily erase and then measure that distance. Now don't, don't go too far in but also don't be too generous. You just need to, to measure whatever is covered by your arms. Next same spot still we also need your biceps girth. So slide your tape all the way here to the armpit and then go all the way uh, around and, and note down that measurement. Make sure to make it uh, or to measure on your dominant arm because sometimes there can be quite a significant difference. Still in the very same spot we also need the sleeve length. So here right at, on the other, so right where your armpit is, right on in, where your armpit is, but on the outside, on the outside, we need to obtain your sleeve length. So from that spot all the way down, all the way down here on the outside of your uh, arm, go all the way down to your wrist, all the way down your wrist or wherever you want your sweater to stop or start. Uh, that's the sleeve length. Then we also need your wrist girth. That should be fairly easy to obtain even on your own. Uh, just measure your wrists at the point where you want your cuffs to start. If you have very strong forearms, you should also obtain um, the girth of your forearms at their widest point and mark the distance to your cuffs as well or to your wrists. Mark the distance as well because often people who have strong forearms and they don't adjust the way they uh, increase here, this, the, increase the sleeves, well then your sleeves, the lower part of your sleeves can end up a little bit too tight so if you have these measurements you can also adjust these. Then we also need the circumference of your neckline. This can be a tricky measurement because your tape is no line. So the actual tape, the width of the tape is distorting your measurement. The easiest way to handle this is measuring your head at its widest point here, right here where I'm measuring. Because after all, your head needs to fit through your uh, collar and you don't want to rely too much on negative ease because then every time you put on your sweater, you are wearing out your collar and in a long time that is bound to look a little bit sloppy and worn out. So that is a very easy alternative. If you want a more generous neckline, then you would have to use some scrap yarn and trace the path of your neckline using the scrap yarn and some pins. Then you can cut away the excess using some scissors and then measure that scrap yarn. That is going to be a lot more reliable than using your tape. Of course, you can also pin the tape to a dummy like this one, but I actually prefer the scrap yarn method. The last measurement we need is the probably most difficult to obtain. We need the neckline depth. So the difference here between this level and this level. So your collarbone and your last cervical vertebra, at least here uh, if you want this kind of neckline. Use a square set like this one here. Then. I have my blackboard here, but you can just tape a piece of paper to your refrigerator door frame or wherever else uh, the tape won't uh, damage the paint or the coating. Place the short end here towards the wall, then feel for your collarbone and then mark that spot and then do the same here on the back. As you can see, there is nothing you can do uh, yourself. You need the help of someone else. Mark these two spots and then you can simply measure here this distance and this will be your neckline depth. If you are alone, then you can also try to uh, measure the distance here from the top of your shoulder down to your uh, collar on this level. Do it in front of a mirror, but even then, please know that you're measuring a diagonal, so your measurement will be slightly off. So it's maybe a little bit easier and more reliable. So if you have a sweater, you feel, okay, this has a super, super nice neckline, then simply measure here this distance here, this distance here from 
uh, this end here down towards this end. Hope you can see this this distance and take that. It probably will be a little bit more reliable. Okay, so now that we have all the important measurements, it's time to start with the calculations. I know it sounds like a lot, but I want you to be aware that it's always the same rule of three. Basically, you are just trying to figure out how often your swatch fits into your sweater or your, the sketch of your sweater. That's all you need to do. First order of business, we need to figure out when you need to stop your uh, knitting your torso. So you are probably around here, but there's still four inches, 10 centimeters left to knit. How much exactly is very easy to figure out. So you know your hip depth and you know your sky depth. So in my case, that's 71 centimeters and 22 centimeters. And you can simply subtract these two numbers and that's basically how long your torso will almost because you should figure in a buffer. So the problem about a raglan sweater is that um, you see this little well ridge well little fold this is unavoidable. However the lower your armpit is the more fabric you will add here and the bigger this little welt is. The, the, the higher your armpit is or the more body hugging it is the smaller this weld will be. However, it will also be so much more difficult and uncomfortable to, to put your arm through your sleeves and then you wear it. So you need to find a middle ground. You could use your positive ease. In my case, that's 5%. However, I found that the middle ground is somewhere at 10%. So around two to three centimeters. This will of course depend a little bit on your size, on your size. So I am actually adding 10% of positive ease, of uh, vertical positive ease to my sky depth. So you simply add those 10% to your sky depth of, in my case, 22 centimeters. And this will be, in my case, 24.2 centimeters. And then you can simply subtract these two numbers. So 71 centimeters minus 24.2 centimeters. That's 46.8 centimeters. That's how high your torso needs to be. Now, of course, you could use those 46.8 centimeters and just use a tape. Do remember that this is after blocking. So it's a little bit more reliable to actually work out how many rows you need to knit. And that's very simple. Just multiply those 46.8 centimeters times your row gauge and the result will be how many rows you need to knit. In my case, 160 rows. This will be even better if you are knitting color work or lace or so where you need to chart out color transitions then uh, you actually need to know how many rows and the centimeters alone isn't what or everything you need to know. After the torso you will be knitting a set of two sleeves and we need to calculate these through as well. And it's actually just as simple. So in my case, my wrist girth is 18 centimeters, my biceps girth is 34 centimeters, and the sleeve length is 50 centimeters. So let's put these numbers together. So the hem is very easy. I know my wrist girth, 18 centimeters, and then I need to add my positive ease to it. So 19 centimeters, 19 centimeters. That's how wide or how loose I want the cuff to be. And then you simply need to multiply these 19 centimeters times your stitch gauge. In my case, that's 40 stitches. That's how many stitches you need to cast on. Well, almost. I want you to measure your hand at its widest point. In my case, that's 24 centimeters. And then I'll take those 40 stitches I worked out and divide it by my negative ease gauge. And the result would be 24.5 centimeters. So this means there would only be a buffer of half a centimeter to squeeze my uh, sleeves through. 
that's a little bit too tight for comfort and that's why I will add one more centimeter so two stitches and that's why I will cast on 42 stitches this is very very important to counter check so some people are very skinny but have very very big hands and then it's very important that you can fit your hand through comfortably of course you can kind of fold it up things like that but still you don't just like with your neck you don't want to put too much stress on the cuff every day because that will wear out and will not look very pretty. Next, we also need to figure out the width of your sleeves at the point where we need to join them to the torso. So we need now the biceps girth that's 34 centimeters and again we'll adjust it for our net positive E sorry. So in my case that would be 37.4 centimeters. And then you simply multiply those 37.4 centimeters times your stitch gauge and the result would be 78 stitches. That's how many stitches I need to have on my needles at the end of knitting this lace. As I said in the beginning, it's always at the exact same. You just multiply things times your stitch and row gauge. The length of your sleeves is another super simple calculation. Just multiply that length times your row gauge and the result will be how many stitches you need to knit those sleeve, uh, sleeves. 170 stitches in my case. Careful here. Remember how we adjusted our sky depth? and moved it a little bit downwards to create a little bit more room here underneath the arms. So I added 2.2 centimeters. Of course, this will move down the point where we join in the sleeves and thus it would foreshorten the sleeves. So theoretically speaking, you would have to subtract these 2.2 centimeters in my case. However, Typically, you want to move your arms around and if you've ever worn a sweater or a shirt or so that is a little bit too short and a little bit too tight, you might have noticed that the cuffs start traveling up. To avoid this, we actually need the temperature or the, this little bit of a buffer. So that's why I actually will use those 50 centimeters. But to be quite precise, you would have to subtract it. And in the last step, we also need to figure out the increases for the sleeves. So we know I have to need 78 stitches at the end of my sleeves and I start with 42 stitch, stitches. And the difference, th those 36 stitches, that's how many stitches I need to increase. Now most people will agree that uh, it's very nice for the cuff to be tight and well fitting but the sleeve typically should be a little bit roomier. So that's why I personally increase one fourth of the stitches right after the cuff. So in my case that's eight stitches. So I will increase by eight stitches right after the cuff and by 28 stitches uh, along the rest of the sleeve. If you want an even even balloonier fit you would have to increase by more stitches so that's up to you. So how do I distribute those 28 increases? Well very easy so I want my cuff to be five centimeters high or long. So my total sleeve length is not 50 centimeters but 45 centimeters. So 45 centimeters times my row gauge that's 153 rows. That's how many rows I have to distribute these D increases sorry these increases so i know i have 153 rows to cover those increases i need to increase 28 stitches typically you increase symmetrical here along a central line so this means two stitches per round 28 divided by 2 is 14. so i need 14 uh, increase rounds so simply divide 153 uh, by 14 uh, rows and the result will be 11 rows so every 11 11th row will be an increase round now very important, place yourself in front of a mirror and take a critical look at your arms. Most arms aren't perfectly conical, so if my arms certainly aren't very muscular. And my forearm girth is almost as wide as the uh, biceps girth. So that's why I will personally move down uh, my uh, increase rate. So instead of 11, I will increase every 10 rounds because I don't want my last increase rounds round to be right below my armpit. 
we use two measurements, this biceps girth here and this um, wrist girth here and the distance in between. Nothing whatsoever speaks against using multiple measurements. So underarm, maybe here elbow and so on. And you can always record the distance here, multiply that times your row gauge and then figure out how many stitches you need to have there. So we just did it the easy way and typically if you have some positive ease that works out. But to be quite correct, you would have to take multiple measurements and then adjust accordingly. Before we can move on to the all important rug line decreases, we need to figure out how many stitches we need to bind off or rather we will put them on hold here below our arms and that is also super simple. So we know uh, our sky width that's 8.5 centimeters and of course we need to apply our positive ease so the result will be 8.9 centimeters. And then simply multiply that number times your stitch gauge and the result will be how many stitches you need to put on hold. In my case, it's 18.5 stitches. Since I can't put half a stitch on hold, I'll round it down to 18 stitches. When it comes to the famous Raglan decreases, a lot of old tutorials, books and patterns will tell you to decrease symmetrical in every second round. So twice here in the front and twice in the back. So here. And this will form the famous Raglan decrease lines. And if you ask me, this rule of thumb is very critical or problematic because it works for a selected few people with the ideal Raglan body and they say, oh, it's just so well and so easy. And for the rest, it leads to the conviction that Raglan sweaters are not for them. They just don't fit them. But if you think about it, it just doesn't make any sense. So this here is my sky depth. And no matter how much weight I gain or lose, if I'm pregnant, if I go to the gym or don't go to the gym, get older or whatever, this sky depth really doesn't change. It will always be the same. However, my biceps girth or here my chest girth might increase. So this means the total number of stitches will increase while this distance will stay the same. And if I only decrease in every second round, the result will be that I have, and I want the same color, the result will be that I have to decrease farther and farther and farther. So as a result, since this here hangs on the top, this line here will move further down and down until it's almost, you know, at your belly button. And then when you lift your arms, you will transport all that fabric here towards your chest area and then when you move them down again all this fabric here bunches up stays put here because you know there's your chest your bust whatever and it stays put here also in the arms and that doesn't look nice and the reason is you decrease in every second round it's just not ideal if you ask me First, let's collect our number. So we start knitting the Raglan decreases right at the point where we join in the sleeves. So here, my torso, I have 206 stitches here on my needles. Then, I mean, we haven't knitted them yet, but at the end of your sleeves, my calculation says, I have 78 stitches here on my needles twice. So left and right. So that's 206 plus two times 78 stitches. And then we also need to put stitches on hold. And we will have to do it here on the sleeve side and on the torso side and here again on the other side. So four times 18 stitches, that's how many stitches we need to put on hold. And if you put everything together, this means in the round after I joined in the sleeves, I will have 290 stitches on my needles. And then I also know how many stitches I will have on my needles at the very end of my sweater. So I have the measurement around my head or maybe you did a different neckline. So for me, that was 55 centimeters. And I simply multiply this times my uh, stitch gauge. So this would be 114 stitches. However, I won't be adjusting this for uh, my positive ease. Typically, you don't want your neck to be super stretchy, uh, neckline to be super, or your collar to be super stretchy. In fact, you want a tight fit. That is why I will be adjusting this and I will actually work with 10 stitches instead. This is up to you. 
but that's what I did. If you work with 114 stitches, that's okay as well. But as you can see, I wanted a, a color that is really nice and well, almost, you know, well, not choking or so, but uh, that's why I went with 110 stitches. Then I also know my sky depth, so that was 24.2 uh, centimeters. However, we need to subtract the color because typically you do not use the color to decrease anymore. I will do a color of 3.5 centimeters. That's up to you. Some do two centimeters, some three, some even four. Typically, it doesn't look all that balanced if you go for the same number you used for your hems and cuffs. So I did five centimeters and for the color, I only do 3.5 centimeters. Either way, whatever you decide on, you need to subtract that number. So 24.2 centimeters minus um, 3.5 centimeters, the result will be 27 centimeters. And then you just need to multiply that times your row gauge and the result will be, in my case, a 70.5 rows. That's how many rows I will knit, continue knitting after I joined in the sleeves and I need to distribute my decreases along those rows. Then in the next step, so I know I start with 290 stitches at the end, the end I want 110 stitches. So the difference is 180 stitches. That's how many stitches I need to decrease and I have this length here, this length here to do it. Now typically you decrease in an orderly way. So this means here along this decrease line, one in front, what you decrease once in front and once after the decrease line and the same here as well. Once in front and once after the decrease line and the same on the back. As a result, you will decrease by eight stitches per round. So we need to decrease altogether 180 stitches and we can decrease eight stitches per round. The result will be, we have 22.5 decrease rounds and we need to fit these decrease rounds into this, into this length. If you remember, we just worked out that I have from the point where I join in my sleeves all the way to up to the collar, I have 70 rows and I need to fit in those 22.5 decrease rounds. So simply divide these two numbers and the result will be a factor, 3.11. What does this mean? Essentially, this means every 3.11 rounds, I need to decrease by eight stitches. Now, what do we do with the fractional stitches? Simply, we multiply it back. So 0 0.11 times um, 22.5 and the result will be 2.5 rows. What does this actually mean? So quite easy. We have, we will decrease in every third round. However, 2.5 times we will decrease in every fourth round. Now this is another fractional, so you can either round up or down. Now this is the mathematical distribution. It will lead to a well-rounded, well-balanced um, shape. So in my case, it's, it will look a little bit like this. Well, obviously here's the cutout. Now I want you to stand in front of a mirror and take a very critical uh, look at your figure. A lot of men have a pronounced V shape and some women have a very pronounced A line with rounded and smaller shoulders. So you can distribute these decreases any way you like. So if you have a very, very strong V shape with very broad shoulders. What you want to do is you want to decrease as late as possible because you want to have a lot of room here for the shoulders and only decrease the majority of the stitches here for the last bit. So this means maybe the first 20 rounds you don't decrease at all and then you decrease in every second round and for the last 10 rounds or so you decrease in every round or you do it exactly the other way around. Uh, you start decreasing very early and then for the last rounds you don't decrease at all anymore because uh, you don't need all that extra room. 
If you use graph paper or any knitting app, you can actually work this out yourself. This goes a little bit beyond this tutorial. I just want you to be aware that it doesn't have to be symmetrical. And just likewise, a lot of people have, or some people <laughs> have very, very big biceps, you know, bodybuilders, these kind of things, people who go to the gym a lot. Now, I told you we will decrease by eight stitches in every second round or third round in my case. You don't have to do that. You could only decrease by four stitches. So you will decrease the torso, but you don't decrease the sleeve stitches at all. Read the pattern and it will make more sense to you. But you could decide that you don't decrease the sleeve stitches at all. Then this portion here, this portion will be much wider here at the shoulders. However, you will also have a lot more room for your big biceps. So there are a lot of small adjustments here you can incorporate uh, on top of what we just covered. But this here, what I showed you, will be a good base. There's one last little bit we need to calculate. So we will or I will uh, raise the neck using short rows later on. But when do we start knitting short rows? Well, that bit is easy. easy. We uh, measured the difference here between my um, collarbone and the last uh, cervical vertebra. In my case, it's 6.5 centimeters. And then you simply multiply that times your row gauge. That's 22 rows. So 22 rows before I reach the, 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 the spot where I need to start with the color 22 rows before that I start shaping the sweater with short rows. Anyway, after all these calculations, it's finally time to continue knitting. So by now you should definitely know how long your torso should be and when you need to stop knitting. So in my case, it's those 46.8 centimeters or 160 rows. We just worked out about 10 minutes ago or so. So I will warm up my knitting needles again and continue knitting until I reach this very spot and then we can join in the sleeves. In the meantime, please consider supporting my work on Patreon. If I took into account all the time that went into this tutorial, knitting samples, re-knitting samples, uh, editing, re-editing and of course recording, I probably would have to charge 10 US dollars or so. Yet it is my honest belief that essential knitting knowledge, like a good sweater tutorial, should be available to everyone and not just the few that can afford it. Yet if you can afford it, then kindly consider subscribing to my Patreon account, even if it's just for a month. Think of it as an honesty box. Help me creating more content for everyone. So, so, so I finished those last, so I finished these last five centimeters in my case. You can kind of see this well, little line here. It's going to block out uh, later on. So I finished my torso and now it's time to get working on the sleeves. Before we can do that, of course, you need to put your stitches on hold. So, um, most interchangeable knitting needle sets come with these kind of cable stoppers so you can put these stitches on hold and this freeze your tips so we can start working on the sleeves. Before we can continue knitting the torso we need to finish a pair of sleeves, so two sleeves. This can be done on circulars, you could do it on double pointed knitting needles, super small circular needles, whatever you prefer. You could even knit them two at a time on um, you know, super super long circulars. I'll link you to my tutorial up in here if you are worried that your sleeves don't end up being symmetrical. I typically knit my sleeves on double pointed knitting needles, but for consistency's sake, let's do it using the magic loop technique. So I will cast on uh, 42 stitches here for a 2x2 uh, two two rib stitch. So I will knit the cuff in the exact same pattern as the hem. I think this looks uh, most balanced. I went down a needle size, so here I am working with uh, three millimeter needles. Remember the rest we are knitting in with 3.5 millimeter needles um, uh, for a super tight and uh, nice cuff. 
and then uh, we can join things in around. So I always pass this additional stitch over, over for a super um, invisible join. And then we can start uh, with the magic loop technique um, following the two by one rib stitch pattern of before. So that part should be simple. As I'm knitting the cuff here, I just wanted to uh, add two little notes, tips. Um, so first of all, apart from changing the needle size, you can of course also consider to change the length of your cable. There is really no need to torture yourself uh, um, with knitting uh, with needles with a too long cable. So do change that and also, uh, before we were knitting in one continuous circle, so and now we need to employ a little trick to use our circulars for a, such a small uh, diameter project. This means you always risk creating ladders here at the transition, uh, no matter if you use uh, circulars or double pointed knitting needles. So if you have a problem with uh, or you notice a problem with ladders around the gaps, then kindly watch my tutorial or my full tutorial on how to prevent ga gaps or ladders uh, when knitting in the round. You'll find the link in the pattern and I'll try to link it in the description below as well. So uh, your uh, cuff will look nice and neat. So here I am in my 17th row and according to my calculations and my pattern, I need to increase by eight stitches here in this last round. And I will do this using a PLL pearl left loop again. So I will just place four increases here on this needle and the other four over on the other side. If you are knitting in one color only, well, you could uh, wait for until your cuff is finished for the increases. It really boils down to preferences a little bit. So there are no hard rules here for uh, placing these increases. I typically place them after the cuff, but when you knit in uh, two colors, that can be a little bit more difficult. So I do them here. And after this uh, last round, it's of course time to switch to the um, larger needles again and switch colors. So I'm changing to 3.5 millimeter needles here and continue with the orange yarn. So I'll uh, switch colors here again. I will use the twist and weave method here um, to switch colors and then continue from here in a stockinette stitch and weave in that tail right away. And, uh, oops, that's the wrong tail, sorry. And just continue in stockinette stitch. And according to my calculations, I will need to increase every 10 rows. So I will continue in stockinette stitch for 10 rows and see you there. So this is just plain stockinette stitch knitting here from here, super simple. And then of course, as you start this next round, do remember to lift that uh, loop back to the knitting needle and knit it together with the next stitch to avoid a jog. And then you can opt to, you don't have to do that. You can opt to leave in that tail as well. Of course, you could also pick a more traditional way to weave in the tail with a tapestry needle, whatever you prefer. Okay, so here I am in my 10th row and now I need to place my increases. And just in case you lost track, it's super easy to count rows. So each V stands for one row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So I'm in my 10th round so I will knit two stitches 
and then I will place a KLL knit left loop. So I will lift that loop here back to the knitting needle and knit it through the back loop. And that's already it. So you will only place two, I mean, you could theoretically speaking, place more increases per round, but um, typically you want to hide those increases under the arms and that's why you only place them on one side. I think KLL or lifted increases in general are pretty invisible, but they will still be somewhat visible, especially if you are working with a yarn that is maybe a little bit more on the rustic side and just one color then um, things can quickly become pretty noticeable. So um, that's why placing it under the arms is quite, well, works quite well. And if you need to join in a new color or a new yarn, and a new ball of yarn, as you knit these sleeves, I recommend doing it under the sleeves as well. This is up to your definition. I mean, so far, this is just a tubular object which has no sides. So you kind of define it. And then here, when I'm two uh, stitches before the end of the row, I will place a KRL, knit right loop here on this side. So I will lift this loop back to the knitting needle and knit it. And then I can finish my round. And that's already it. So there's no big secret here. Just place the increases under uh, the arm and then continue knitting. So what you can also do is, so oh, that's something I recommend. It's very easy to lose track. So just mark the place where you place the, or the row where you placed the increase here with a stitch marker. Don't go directly through the increase that might wear it out. Go through one of the adjacent stitches and then continue knitting. And from here you continue uh, knitting across in plain stock and knit stitch and increase according to your calculations. Um, it's as simple as that and you always increase two stitches after the beginning of your round and two stitches before the end of the round. And just to give you an impression how this will look, so I will place a stitch marker every 10 rows where I also place my increases. So this here will be the result. And then you can simply count your stitch markers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and so on. And then you know, okay, I uh, uh, increased enough. So quite a couple of hours later, I finished my two sleeves. I definitely urge you to try on your sleeves to check if they are long enough and fit the way you want them to fit. They should reach almost up here to the armpit, uh, almost because of course we, most people will keep a little buffer here. So that's the 10% uh, positive ease I added to my sky depth. Uh, this should also, of course, uh, here be wide enough. Remember, uh, after blocking, these are gonna stretch out quite a little bit more. So that's gonna be my uh, the positive ease I added. And if you are unsure, you could, of course, pre-block these sleeves as well, the way I did the torso. You don't have to, but if you wanna be 100% sure, you could do that. Also do remember that right now mistakes are still uh, fixable. So if you notice, well, it's a little bit too tight, you could unravel a couple of uh, uh, rows and then, you know, add some increases or so, or if they're too short yet, we'll add a couple of more rows. Right now, before we, uh, we haven't attached them to the torso yet, right now mistakes are still fixable. Once you are satisfied, we can put the stitches for our under armpit well, seam on hold. So according to my calculations, I need to put on 18 stitches on hold. So here, this gap, gap here marks the uh, center of my decrease line. So I already prepared a spare uh, knitting needle with a very short cable. 
and now I'm just going to knit nine stitches with this new needle. I mean you can also put them on hold the traditional way but this is going to be a little bit easier. Nine stitches so that's four nine stitches. And then I will simply um, also do the exact same thing here on the other end or rather I don't knit these stitches here on this side I'm also going to just slip nine stitches here to that side of the needle one two three four five six seven eight nine and now I have um, 18 stitches here on this small little needle. Of course, we actually don't need that. So what I will do is I will just attach my cable stoppers here to either in and and just put these stitches here on hold. Of course, you will have to do the exact same thing with the other sleeve as well. Just uh, knit nine stitches and then slip those 18 stitches or however many stitches you calculated to a stitch holder. And next we need to break the yarn because we won't continue knitting with this yarn. However, I want you to keep a rather long tail of roughly, well, 20 inches, uh, 50 centimeters or so on both sides because we are going to use a uh, um, this little tail here for seaming later on. Now this tail can be a little bit annoying so use a spare hair clip to secure it so it doesn't uh, interfere with your uh, project and then uh, you finished knitting the sleeves and we are ready to tackle the uh, raglan decreases. Next, it's time to attach the sleeves and knit the raglan decreases. Before we can do that, we also need to put the same number of stitches on hold here. So 18 here and 18 over here. But before you do that, um, I want you to take a very close look at your knitting. So right now, this is one symmetrical round. So you can define where you want to attach your sleeve. So I want you to take a very, very close look at your knitting. Maybe there is this one wonky little stitch or maybe you split the yarn in one place or maybe, I don't know, the places where you uh, changed yarn, changed color, joined in a new skein. Maybe that is slightly visible. And then you might consider to place that wonky little stitch right underneath your armpits. So for me, there's this one little stitch here. Can you see that? That seems to have well, almost a little bit like a different color or so. I don't know what happened there. However, I'm sure I want to place this stitch right underneath my armpit. So I trace this column of knit stitches here all the way to the top. I mean, if you're off one stitch or so, it doesn't matter. So this here would be the center of my armpit and then because I need to put 18 stitches in hold, I take half of that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This here will be, or I define this here as the beginning of my first armpit. And then because I have 20, my round here has 206 stitches, this means the beginning of the other armpit will be exactly on the opposite side. So I will need to count 103 stitches and pl then place the other stitch marker here on this side and I'll quickly do that. So just a little tip here. I think I'm a fairly good knitter, but I simply can't count. So here's what I do. So I go three, five, three, five is 10, three, five, three, five is 20. And then as you can see, I place one stitch marker. And then I do the exact same thing. Three, five, three, five is 10, three, five, three, five is 20. And then I place another stitch marker. And that really helps me counting. Otherwise I would get lost and I would have to recount three times or so. 
Okay, so I have one stitch mark over here and one over here. Counting these stitches almost took me longer than knitting the sleeves. It's that bad with me, but whatever, I managed to do this. So um, my working yarn is here and I already attached my needle tips uh, to the core, back to the cords. So of course I will continue with the 3.5 millimeter needles. And then I want you to knit up until you hit the first stitch marker. It doesn't no matter which one, uh, just until you hit the very first stitch marker. And I'll see you there. Okay, so I'm here at the first stitch marker. You may slip it or put it to the side at the moment because it's easy to lose it. See, that's what I meant. So I'm just going to put it here all to the side. And now you need to put another 18 stitches on hold. So I will do it here with a spare needle and a spare cable, but you do you. Uh, use whatever stitch holder system you prefer. And now comes the, well, tricky part. So now we can attach the sleeves. So here is one sleeve. It doesn't matter which sleeve. The only uh, thing you need to ensure is that you will attach them um, like so. So here are my 18 stitches on hold. We are going to close this hole later on using a, a special grafting me method, the Kitchener stitch. So you only need to uh, make sure that these two sections align. And then you can actually simply knit across without a special technique. So here I am. This is my last stitch and then you can simply knit across. Maintain a nice enough tension so you don't create too big a gap. But other than that, you just knit across. So uh, I know you might have expected something totally different, like some very arcane knitting knowledge or so, but you actually just knit across like so. Of course, this will be a little bit fiddly with all these cables, cords and uh, stitch markers and needle tips flapping around. So uh, I would still advise to go as slowly as possible. So uh, because any mistake will be somewhat visible later on, uh, you can fix things uh, through blocking, but of course, uh, why not just go slowly and knit across? Now, one thing I forgot, but we can actually remedy this quite easily. So I forgot to peer right at the gap. I forgot to place a stitch marker. So this stitch marker will be very important because it will mark our raglan decrease lines. So sorry for that, right where you um, switch, you need to place one uh, stitch marker. It dropped off the needle, so uh, please uh, forgive me. And as you can see, I'm actually not using the magic loop technique here. So I continue with my rather small uh, diameter needles here and just remove the stitches here from this uh, sleeve needle here. Okay. So this finishes, this here finishes my sleeve stitches. This is the very last stitch. So I can remove the sleeve needle here. And then we pick up our torso stitches again, like so. And again, without any special technique. Okay, and now I won't forget it. Uh, I will place another stitch marker here. Note how I color code them. So over here, over here I have a green stitch marker and here this is a silver stitch marker. This will make things a little bit easier later on. And then you just continue knitting across until you come to the next stitch marker and we are going to do the same thing all over again. And I'll see you there. 
And over here you do the exact same thing. So first of all, I put the stitch marker to the side and uh, make sure that I don't forget it this time. And then I'm going to slip 18, um, 18 stitches here to another spare cord. So I need uh, four cords all together, quite a lot, but uh, you know, as I said, the scrap yarn works as well if you don't have that many super short cords. And I'll slip 18 stitches here to a cord. Okay, all 18 stitches are safe and sound here on their little spare stitch holder. And then you pick up the second sleeve. And again, you just need to make sure that you align the two stitch holders. That's everything you need to do. Well, just stuff that um, tail inside. And then again, without a special technique, simply knit across. So knit across those stitches and plain stockinette stitch. And I did it again, of course. So here is my gap. And we need to place the stitch marker. But of course, that is the very reason why I like these bulb shaped stitch markers so much. Because if you forget them, you can just attach them again. And if you need to remove them, that too is possible as well. And then uh, just like before, you simply knit across uh, that sleeve as well. And free all these stitches from this stitch holder here. So knitting across. Okay, and here over on this side, you place another little stitch marker. Here is my little stitch marker. And then you need to close this last gap here as well. Again, no special technique. You simply knit across. Maintain nice tension. Don't be like me and forget to place the stitch marker. And this stitch marker is super, super important. And then you can finish your first round. Now, as you knit across this side here, the, which will be the front of your sweater, I want you to count along as well. But I also want you to, want, well, at least you should consider doing that. You may want to place a special stitch marker right in the center. Either way, once you place this center, center stitch marker, I want you to knit, uh, continue knitting across until you are three stitches before the very first stitch marker. So we can start with our raglan decreases. We are three stitches here before our first stitch marker. Now there are a million different ways to knit raglan decreases or the raglan, what's going to be the raglan uh, line. But here's what I propose. So three stitches before the first stitch marker. We will knit these three stitches together. Then you knit one stitch, slip the marker, and after the stitch marker, we are going to knit a left leaning decrease. Pick the one you prefer and that looks best for your knitting style. Maybe you like SSK, slip slip knit. Maybe you prefer a slip slip pearl knit, SSPK. I have a video here on YouTube with the best left leaning decreases. I'll link it to you up in here and I really urge you to watch it. Knit a swatch and pick what looks best for you. I will actually knit SSK, slip slip knit. That is the left leaning decrease that typically looks best for me, 
but please you do you and then you continue knitting across the sleeve again go slowly uh, this first the first couple of rounds actually will st still feel somewhat tight here as you knit across the sleeve but uh, once you get these raglan decreases going, things will be much easier and better. And over here on this side, once you hit the stitch mark, I want you to stop two stitches before the stitch marker. And that's why I color coded the stitch marker. So before a green stitch marker, I will stop three stitches before and before a um, silver stitch marker two stitches before and again you will knit the exact same combination of decreases you start with a decrease uh, with a knit two together slip the marker knit one and then i will knit ssk again you knit whichever left leaning decrease you prefer and then you continue knitting so over here on this side you do the exact same thing you stop three stitches before the stitch marker and knit it together and then you knit one and slip one stitch um, I pierce the yarn here well sometimes happens I slip one stitch and now one note here so I am keeping one stitch in between these two decreases and then I here over on this side I knit an SSK as well so it's always the same sequel knit two together first then knit one then SSK some people prefer to keep two stitches between their decreases so the the decrease line will be a little bit wider other people don't even keep one stitch in between that's something i never do because if you place an ssk right next to a knit together you will create well well holes or almost eyelets things like that uh, this can be quite decorative, but I don't like it. So I always keep one stitch in between and because I want my shoulders to be a tiny fraction roomier, I steal that stitch from the torso stitches and that's why I color coded these stitch markers. If you have rather rounded shoulders, very uh, not very strong shoulders, you could steal the stitch from the sleeve stitches. Do whatever you prefer. Um, I just do it like that. Now here in the next round, I passed my beginning of the round marker. So here in the next round, according to my calculations, I don't need to do anything. So I will just knit across this round and in fact, uh, three more rounds uh, or two more rounds. There's one more thing I will do. So here is an SSK and I typically knit all my SSKs through the back loop. Saw that? So I just knit all my SSKs through the back loop. For me, this creates the neatest decrease lines. But uh, so this is entirely optional. All the SSKs. So all the stitches after the stitch marker, very easy to remember. Uh, I knit through the back loop. For me, this creates very nice decrease lines. Maybe it does for you, maybe it doesn't. Try it out on a swatch, but that's what I will do. Anyway, from here, you will continue knitting those decrease lines in the exact same way. So before and after the stitch marker, you decrease with knit two together and then SSK and you keep one stitch uh, in between. In the meantime, here's one little tip. So um, I secure my gap stitches with two stitch markers here on either side just to keep them closer together because the less stress they experience, the, the less they will wear out. And of course, that will ensure that once we seam this shot, things will look super neat and nice. Just a thing to consider. So just to make sure, so I'm here in my fourth round and according to my calculations, this will be my second decrease round. So again, three stitches before my first stitch marker, I will knit a knit two together, then I knit one stitch, 
slip the marker and knit an SSK. And I will do the almost exact thing uh, before every stitch marker in this round as well. The only thing that's, uh, that changes is where you keep the one stitch in between those two stitches, but otherwise it's exactly the same thing. So I will continue uh, knitting or these raglan decreases uh, according to my calculations and I'll see you, well, somewhere in the middle, I think. So, as you can see, I made some good progress in the last couple of hours and I can finally try on my sweater in the making. And I invite you to do the exact same because now is a very, very good time to analyze your fit. So, if, I mean, you know, the upper part here isn't and the sleeves aren't blocked yet, so there will be 5% more ease, my positive ease. So I am personally quite happy with this kind of fit. If you aren't, well, analyze it and see if you can fix things. I want you to look out for, uh, specifically for two little things. So first of all, um, if you, this, these seams here, we haven't uh, closed them yet. But if you have problems getting into your sleeves at this moment, well, you might be in for some trouble because once we close this, this is going to be even tighter. So that's what I often notice is that people knit their sleeves a little bit too tight and then they can't get in. And if the armpit hole is too high up, it's the same issue. Another thing I want you to look out for is the Raglan decrease line. So as you can see, this line here, short as it may be, is more or less straight. Sometimes you see that, I'm trying to fake this here now, that it's more curved, so like this. And this happens when the arm has too little fabric and needs to steal it here from the torso. So people who have broad shoulders or a very, very big or strong biceps, well, often then uh, there's too little fabric here. It tries to steal fabric from the torso and you end up with this kind of curved line. In this case, you might consider, I mean, this probably stretches out a little bit more, but you might consider redoing this section and staggering your decreases a little bit more. Start a little bit later and maybe even consider not decreasing the sleeve stitches and only here the torso stitches for the first couple of 10, 20 rounds and then um, bunch up the creases a bit, little bit later so you can accommodate those broader shoulders or this uh, uh, bigger biceps. Anyway, I will continue knitting as it is and I will see you right when I'm here at the neck. Okay, so as you can see, I made some good progress and I only need to knit 22 more rounds. So according to my calculations, this is the time where I need to start shaping the neckline using short rows. So my knitting here in front almost reaches up to my collarbone, which is around here. So please do keep in mind that we will add a band of ribbing as a collar. So I will do 3.5 centimeters. That's around uh, 1.4 inches of ribbing all the way around. So there probably still needs to be a little bit of a buffer from this point here where we will stop knitting in front to your collarbone, but just a little bit. So here's the theory. Instead of continuing in the round, we are knitting short rows. So we start here in the middle and then go all the way around. However, we don't finish the round. Instead, we turn around and knit in the other direction. And then each row gets shorter and shorter. So this will, each row gets shorter and shorter. And this will create the cutout here in front while simultaneously raising the neck. That's the theory. However, we still don't know how much shorter each row should be. Two stitches, three stitches, four stitches. What's the perfect fit? How do you work this out? Well, actually, this is remarkably easy. 
And the best way to figure this out is using graph paper or better do it online. I am using a program called Stitch Fiddle. I'm not affiliated with them, but I, it works great. I'm using it all the time and the first couple of charts are free, so why not recommend it? Now, if we go back to my calculations, I know that the final circumference of my collar will be 110 stitches. I also know that my neck cutout will be 22 rows high. No, we only want to have a cutout here in front and not on the back. I mean, that's the whole point. So I will use half of those 110 stitches. And then I can simply create a grid that is 55 stitches wide and 22 stitches high. The advantages of programs like Stitch Fiddle, no, there are others out there, is that you can adjust the grid according to your gauge. So these little boxes, they aren't square but rectangular, just like a knit stitch. If you use graph paper, the image will be slightly distorted, but you know, it's not going to be a big deal. And then I mark the exact center, so that's my beginning of the round marker where I will start the short rows. Now short rows are amazing, but also very predictable. You have to reduce the stitch count every second row. And we will need one last round where we resolve all short rows. And then you can basically tie around. Maybe keep a little buffer on the side because that makes short rows always a little bit neater. And then the easiest way uh, would be to shorten the short rows by two stitches in every row. Then the result would be something almost like a short v-neck. You know, you simply paint. There's no big, you know, you don't need to chart anything, simply paint those stitches and the result will be a v-neck. Now, if we take a close look at a circle, then you might notice that it starts rather shallow, almost level, and as you approach the other edge, uh, the incline gets steeper and steeper. And we can try to recreate this with our short rows. So maybe we only keep one stitch in between each short row up in here, and then we do two, and here at the bottom, maybe three or four. And then you can simply take a look at your picture and decide for yourself if that's what you want. Since our grid represents our gauge, that actually works just that easy. And there's absolutely no right or wrong here. Go to any store and check out uh, their tops and you will probably find as many color shapes as there are tops. It could be more U-shaped, a little bit more V-shaped, or maybe you want something well-rounded or a little bit sh more shallow. There's one last bit here. So I used half of my stitches to calculate and only kept two stitches as a buffer on each side. So this essentially means that for my last couple of rounds of short rows, I will actually be past my, the rug line decreases up here in front. So I will have to skip them. This means I will end up with more stitches for my color than originally anticipated. That's why initially I said, well, for the color, maybe round down quite a little bit to account for that. Now, if you go for a much deeper cutout, then you would have to take this in account and increase, uh, decrease, sorry, decrease quite a little bit faster take that into account because basically you know where you start the cutout, then you need to be finished with your decreases here in front only. The back doesn't matter, in front only a little bit faster. Anyway, once you figure that out, we can start actually knitting the cutout. Okay, let's knit those short rows. So we will start here right in the center where we placed our beginning of the round stitch marker. Before you begin, make sure that you have an equal number of stitches here between your stitch marker. Sometimes, you know, you miss the decrease or so, just to make sure. And then you simply knit across this round as normal. So the, you just stick to this very same repeat 
The only difference is that we will stop or I will stop four stitches here before I reach this stitch marker. But other than that, you stick to the very same repeat. Also important for me, this isn't a decrease round. So as I approach my stitch markers, I slip them and then simply knit across as normal. Well, I do um, twist the SSKs, but other than that, I just knit across as normal. So the start of your short row shaping has literally nothing to do with the fact that you need to place a raglan decrease or not. Uh, these two may coincide, but they can, you know, can be totally separate thing. Okay, so here I am three stitches before my middle of the round marker and now it's time to knit the actual short row. So you can basically use any short row technique you want, wrap and turn, uh, shadow wrap, German short row, uh, whatever you prefer, but I'm actually going to use a variation of Japanese short rows. So I'm three stitches here before my stitch marker. I'm actually going to knit this third stitch here. And now I'm going to turn around. My work is getting a little bit heavy. I'm going to turn around. And now I will slip this stitch, not knit it, I will slip it. And then I will pick, come on, pick, <laughs> pick a stitch marker here and put it around my working yarn like so. Let it dangle down and then I will continue purling in the other direction. Later on, we will uh, pick up this additional stitch and we are going to um, knit it together with this stitch here. So there's a little hole here, but that's all right. Uh, we are going to close it later on. And then we, I just purl here across in the other direction. A word of warning here, a lot of people have a different knit uh, and purl tension. So as you purl across, please go slowly and maintain an even tension. It's somewhat easy to mess up uh, your stitch definition here. Another uh, thing I want to mention. So for me, this isn't a decrease round or row rather now. However, if it is for you, then you would have to decrease before and after the stitch marker. Now here on the wrong side, everything is upside down. So this is a silver stitch marker. This means on the wrong side. So I color, remember how I color coded my stitch markers. This is a silver stitch marker. So three stitches before that silver stitch marker, I would have to knit an SSP slip slip purl. So I slip two stitches purl wise, slip them back to the knitting needle and then I purl them together through the back loop. If this is too fast, no worries. I linked all of these um, stitches in the actual pattern. And then here after the stitch marker, I, um, sorry, have to purl two stitches together. Now also pay attention on the wrong side, purl two together is actually the stitch that looks slightly sloppy. So consider tightening it up a little bit. And then you can just continue uh, purling across the uh, full round. So over here on this side, we are going to play the exact same game. So three stitches before for the center of the round stitch marker, I'm going to knit this stitch here. Then I'm going to uh, slip it knitwise here, sorry, slip it knitwise. And then I place another stitch marker. Again, we will need this stitch marker to lift this stitch here back or the strand back to the knitting needle. And then Oops, 
I continue knitting in the other direction. So placing this stitch marker here is the full trick, a uh, full trick, yeah. Um, if this is a little bit too fast for you, I'll try to upload a full tutorial on um, Japanese short rows. So you can watch it at your own leisure if this is too fast. However, again, you can pick any other short row technique as well if you feel well. This sounds a bit too complicated, which it isn't. But if, it, if you feel that's the case, then please use that. And now for me, this actually is a decrease round. So in this round, I will just as usual place my decreases before and after the stitch marker. So the um, short row knitting doesn't interfere with your um, raglan decreases at all. At all. You just continue them as, as usual. So as you approach uh, the other side, there is a visible gap here. And this is a little bit tricky. So here you need to stop three stitches before the stitch mark or rather three stitches according to my calculations. So. This is three stitches. Then I again, I'm going to knit one stitch. Then I turn around, turn around. Again, I slip this marker up point to point, And then I attach another stitch marker here. The number of stitches you keep between depends on, of course, the way you want to plant your cutout. But for me, it's three stitches. So it's going to be the exact same uh, thing in every row. Just wanted to show you this bit. Again, uh, I'll try to upload a full tutorial. I made some good progress in the last hour or so. And as you can see, there are tons of stitch markers here dangling down. But I really wanted to show you one more little bit. So here, this is my Raglan stitch marker. And after the Raglan stitch marker, there are only three stitches left. So I knit across. And here will be my next turn. So I turn around like so, slip my sti mark, sti stitch and place my uh, Japanese short row marker just like before. Come on, there you go. But now, as you can see, I don't have enough stitches to add my decrease anymore. So I don't decrease. And then here after um, the stitch marker, of course, I there's room for my decrease. But what I just wanted to show you, even though it might be obvious to some, uh, your short rows are more important. So if you can't place a decrease anymore, well, then you don't. Uh, the, the, the raglan decreases and the short rows are not related, so, so to speak. So you layer them on top of each other, but that doesn't mean uh, you, you, your short rows need to stop here at the decrease marker. They can, they can breach sort of into the shoulder as well. It really depends on the kind of cutout you want, but I want one that is a little bit more well-rounded and then a little bit bigger. So I just stopped knitting uh, my short rows here. And that was uh, my Raglan decreases here. Anyway, I will continue knitting across here and uh, see you once it's time to uh, finish these Raglan decreases. So here over on this side, of course, we can also uh, continue the Raglan decreases. It's just this one stitch marker, but uh, you just don't decrease there. Anyway, see you at the end. Okay, so I finished knitting my short rows here. There are many, many stitch markers. 
I'm in a right side row here and as you can see I knitted a couple of stitches past my front raglan decrease. And before we can start knitting the collar, there is one last step we need to do. We need to resolve these short row stitches and that's actually fairly simple. So you knit up to the position of the first stitch marker. You lift it back to the knitting needle. Uh, you remove the marker and then you knit these two stitches together. Then you knit the next stitch here. There is another stitch marker. You lift it back to the knitting needle. Make sure that the leading leg is here in front and not in the back. And you knit it together. And this here is my Raglan decrease marker. You don't need it anymore. And like this you need to resolve all stitch markers here on the left uh, right side sorry on the right side so it takes a little bit of time but go slowly you are almost done with your sweater here so there's no need to hurry there is one very, very important thing you need to observe. So when you are knitting Japanese short rows in the round, these um, stitches here on the left side need to be resolved with an SSK. So you hear once the one stitch before the stitch marker, you slip that knitwise, then you slip the stitch marker back to your knitting needle knitwise as well. Slip that knitwise and then SSK these two stitches. If you, um, I have three stitches here in between. If you don't do this, you will absolutely end up with holes. Of course, we don't want any holes here at the neckline. So keep that in mind that here on the other side, you need to resolve these uh, stitches a little bit differently. So here is another of these stitches. Slip that knitwise, slip the marker back to your knitting needle, slip it knitwise as well, and then knit them together through the back loop. This will ensure that you end up with, oh, with super nice short rows. If you don't, you end up with holes. Anyway, I will knit across the rest of the round from here onward. So I finished knitting across this one round. I already broke my uh, yarn here and now it's time to knit the color. Before you do that, Consider trying on your work in progress one more time. Check if everything fits. Is your neck high enough? Does it, the cutout look good and so on. Please, it takes only a minute or so. So please do that. Then you probably started or stopped knitting your short row somewhere here. So this is my Raglan line and you stopped it probably, let's see. So this is my Raglan line. You probably stopped knitting your short row somewhere here. Here, this is my beginning of the round marker. Well, I won't finish this round uh, and join a new color here in the middle because that's going to be the very center of my um, sweater. And whenever you join in a new color, you always leave behind a, a little jog and uh, no matter how diligent you are. So I am actually joining in the new yarn here on top of my shoulders. Um, you can use any method you like to join in the new yarn. And then uh, if your yarn allows it, you may consider um, weaving in the tail as you go. Now we will knit the collar in a two by two rib stitch. However, uh, if I, if I would purl right now, you would end up with this kind of marbled uh, edge. So uh, you have to, if you change colors, you have to knit across 
one more row in plain stock and knit stitch so i'm going to knit across one more round and then in the next round i will start with the ribbing so i will quickly uh, weave in the tail here and finish this round so i finished this one round here at the join consider lifting that leg back to the knitting needle and knitting it together with the next stitch and now we can start knitting across in the um, rib stitch however you may consider uh, switching needle sizes again so i'm actually going down to three uh 0.5 millimeter and you uh, might actually also notice that I am um, so far I used the five inch tips and now here I am switching to the four inch tips because the diameter is um, rather small and this makes things a little bit easier for me to handle. Now this is a kind of tricky decision because um, Obviously, you don't want uh, your color to be too constricting. Oh, and another thing you may consider is you may weave in this tail as you go as well. While I happily knit across my color here, we also quickly need to talk about two things. So first of all, uh, we need to talk about the size of the color. So I defined it as a three and a half centimeters wide, 1.4 inches or so. Now, uh, we will actually knit a folded color that this means I don't I, I will actually need seven centimeters of fabric but if you take a look a close look at such a fold you need to see that the immediate fold line also uses up a little bit of fabric so I will actually knit probably around seven and a half centimeters of ribbings or that translates to well roughly 28 rows or rounds rather uh, but there's no need to count rounds here. I mean, you can if you want to, but uh, you can just measure your fabric and then uh, fold over your work in progress and see if this sounds about right. And if your color ends up being three and a half centimeter, 3.4 centimeters or 3.6 centimeters instead, three and a half, well, it's not going to be a big deal. And the other thing is you may notice that your um, color and the, 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 the stitches remaining on your needles is not divisible by uh, four anymore because maybe you missed a decrease maybe it isn't uh, it wasn't divisible uh, by four in the first place so I should end up with 110 stitches well I have 114 because I missed or skipped a couple of decreases here on the front because of my short rows it's not divisible by uh, uh, four. So what you can always do is you can uh, sneak in a couple of like one decrease here on the back of your shoulder and another decrease uh, here over here on the other side. Where is it? Here over on the other side. So this is these are my raglan uh, decreases. And you just sneak in one knit two together on either side and things are going to be fine. I mean, you could also possibly do an increase, but typically uh, your color is rather prone. Uh, well, it's typically a little bit too wide rather than too uh, narrow. So it often stands up a little bit. So I think a decrease is typically a little bit better. And you see, I mean, no one is going to notice this. No one, trust me. Anyway, I will knit across the seven and a half centimeters and then I'll see you there and then we'll talk about how to uh, well, bind off this beauty or rather how to attach the color on the inside. I'm going to show you a fun technique there and I'll see you in a bit. So I made some good progress in the past half hour or so and I want you to use this opportunity to take a very critical uh, look at your work in progress. First of all, try it on one more time, see if this actually fits. And secondly, take a very close look at those short rows. 
it does it really look that neat or are there some stitches that are a little bit wonky i want you to know that a you can redo this section if it doesn't look right you can do redo it i mean you will have to unravel a little bit but that's that because some of this will block out and some of it won't and the second thing there are also other ways to knit a neckline so you can also instead of continuing with the ribbing you can also bind off stitches all stitches and then pick them up from one row below this sometimes looks a lot neater for beginners it also involves picking up stitches which is of course also not the easiest part that's why i didn't do it for this tutorial and i won't show it in this tutorial you can comment below if you want me to show you how to pick up stitches however uh, here right here and now i want you to know that this remains an option if your neckline just doesn't look pretty you can always unravel just the color bind off and then pick up stitches anew. So, as you can see, I made some good progress and now it's time to finish our sweater, finally finish it. So in the first step, I would definitely fold things over and check if your color seems about right. Is this as wide as you want it to be? And then we need to attach it here to the inside. There are multiple, multiple ways to do that and a lot of them involve using a tapestry needle. This can be very annoying because your tail needs to be very long and for the first couple of stitches you need to drag, on, drag along this super super long tail. Now we are not going to do this here. I'm going to show you a seamless way to do this or rather seamless in the terms of knitting. So we are going to bind it off right away. Let's show you how to do that. So here is what we are going to do. We are going to fold things over and then see this line here, this line of red stitches. And they are, these will they appear as pearl stitches, these little loops here. Of course, we knit it across, but we can see you can see these little pearl bumps here. And we are going to lift this, these pearl bumps here back to our knitting needle. And then we are going to knit these two stitches together and bind off in the same breath. This has the advantage that you can unravel your color anytime because you really need to make sure that this isn't, that you don't bind off too tight. You will have the same problem when you use a tapestry needle. So often a lot of people sew things shut, shut and then they notice it's too tight. With a bind off, it's very easy to unravel. Plus the actual bind off line lends a little bit stability to the whole contraption. So that's all nice. But as you can see, I will do it with a, well, this is a four millimeter needle and the rest of the sweater was of course 3.5 millimeters and this is only three millimeters. So that's what we are going to do. So this will be slightly fiddly, especially for the first couple of stitches. So. I'm gonna pick up the loop here directly below it, slip it back to my knitting needle and knit it together. Then I'm actually gonna knit one stitch so I will only skip every second stitch. Then I go below here so we knitted this stitch here with this stitch so I pick up the next stitch so I always uh, skip two. Now you could bind off in pattern, but you know, nobody is going to see this anyway. So I'm not going to do that. So, and then I bind off, knit the next stitch here and bind off. And then I go down below. So we did this here, we did this. So I'm going to pick up, ah, this is a little bit difficult for you to see. So here, this loop, I'm going to pick up this loop here back to the knitting needle. And knit it. And then bind off. Because I'm aware this is a little bit difficult to see. I mean, there's this whole sweater here in front of me uh, just to uh, show you things close up. So this is the first knit stitch of this pearl col column. 
And if you fold things over here, this here is the corresponding pearl column on the wrong side. And this here, this is the pearl bump I'm going to pick up and knit together with this stitch. Then I'm going to ignore this pearl bump in here for the first pearl stitch uh, of this pearl ridge. The corresponding knit ridge is this one here. And here I'm going to pick up this pearl bump, this one. I'm going to knit these together. And then over here, again, I'm going to knit these together, skip this and so on. Now here's a smart tip. Instead of a uh, knitting needle, you can also use a crochet. So just slip that stitch to the knitting needle, keep the yarn in the back and then go through the stitch here on your knitting needle and then pick up, where is it, this stitch, go through that uh, loop as well and then pull the yarn through uh, both stitches and actually through the third as well. Then uh, again, I skip one stitch, so I only go through this stitch and through this. And here again, I go through this stitch. And here, down below, I try. Now it really helps, as you can see, if you use a rather sharp uh, crochet, go through both stitches and then through that, oops, through that stitch as well. So I made it all the way around. Um, this is the very last stitch here I need to pick up. Then I bind off this stitch here. And theoretically speaking, you could um, break the yarn here and then weave in the tail. However, I actually want you to try on your sweater right away and check if this actually fits across your head and you didn't accidentally bind off too tightly. If you did, you can easily unravel this, just pull on it and then you might need to knit the last round one more time to make it neat. But otherwise you can still unravel this, um, but uh, just try it on first. Once you are satisfied, you can graft one stitch. So just go below this last little uh, bind of stitch. Go all the way around. Go here below this V here, C as well. And pull tight. And then you can weave things in with a sharp tapestry needle. It's quickly had to change things and I typically, I mean, you know, do whatever you want. I typically follow um, one rib here all the way up and one more time in the other direction. See, I pierce right through. stretch things out and then you can actually hide the rest of the tail here in the uh, pocket you created uh, inside. Just tr trim the access. So there you have it. Here is our lovely little color. This is the inside. You have this lovely uh, reinforcing bind of line and here on the outside. This is super, super smooth and invisible. So now that we successfully bound off the color, there's one last little thing we need to do. We still need to close here these hole, uh, holes underneath the armpit and we will do so using a blunt tapestry needle. Before we can do that, you need to slip these all these stitches back to a knitting needle. If you used cables uh, like I did here, you can simply attach a spare um, needle tip here to either end. I will actually slip them to some double pointed knitting needles because it's easier to handle on camera, but you absolutely don't need to do that. Okay, so my stitches are back on a, uh, a set of knitting needles and I thread my 
tail on a tapestry needle. And now we need to close this using a Kitchener stitch. If you've never done the Kitchener stitch before, please knit two swatches, watch my tutorial on the Kitchener stitch and then try it, for, try it out first and then uh, commit. You don't want to mess up this. It's very or highly visible. Now you can see here almost looks like ladders. That's because, I mean, you put this on stitch holders, it was flapping this way and that way, that wore out that gap. So we are going to try to close this a little bit. The Kitchener stitch starts with two preparation stitches and typically a lot of people tell you to skip them. Well, I'm not one of them. In fact, I will tell you to enlarge them. So first, uh, we are trying to close this gap a little bit. So here we will pull the yarn here underneath that stitch, see? And then we go underneath that stitch here and that stitch. See what I'm doing here? So I'm just following the natural path of these knit stitches. So I'm not really doing it, forcing any new connections. I'm just trying to reinforce it. And then we will come in here from the side and then do our preparation stitch. So the preparation stitches go into this stitch purl wise. But we are doing it here from the side so this is connected. And then try to maintain a nice tension here. And then we need to do the exact same thing here over on this side. So here's our stitch and then we go into this stitch knit wise, but we do it from here by creating a bridge from the adjacent stitch that's going to help us close the hole. And if you pull tight here, if you pull tight, you can already see this looks a lot neater than previously. And from here we can do the natural um, Kitchener stitch. Uh, repeat. So drop this stitch, knit wise, go into the adjacent stitch purl wise. Pull tight. Not, you know, really tight, but you know, a little bit. Then uh, drop this stitch purl wise, go into the adjacent stitch knit wise. That's the full Kitchener stitch repeat. Very easy to remember if you ask me. And uh, try to maintain a nice tension as you uh, close this always take a quick note at your knitting if the seam looks well enough if it isn't uh, retrace your steps you can also use your um, knitting needle and tighten up these stitches a little bit more more if you think well this looks a little bit too loose and then we are going to go all the way across these stitches and I'll see you uh, sorry, purlwise, and I'll see you over on the other side, but just, you know, this is already looking good. We will need to go over this section one more time later on, but for now, I think uh, it's fair enough. So we have one stitch left here on either needle, and then now we need to, well, basically try to recreate the same thing we did over here, over on this side. So. I will drop this stitch here knitwise, like I usually would. We can pull the yarn through. Now we need to graft a connection over on this side. So I will go underneath this stitch and then over here on this side, see? So I'm going all the way around and then I will, of course, drop this stitch purlwise, drop this stitch purlwise, but again, I will try to create a connection. Now, uh, you can kind of look at what's going on here and where you feel, if you stretch things out, it's going to be a little bit more visible. So, like so. So here is our connection and where does it look like it needs a little bit? So here we have a big hole and the way you should think of this is you should think of this as trying to cover this up with duplicate stitch. And if you see, okay, I went wrong. Well, okay, this increased the hole over on this side. Well, apparently, uh, 
it seems to be better to go around this. So you can really try tie around a little bit, go slowly, and then think of this as covering this area using duplicate stitch. Just uh, always follow the natural path of your uh, knit stitches and cover things up. That's what you're doing. You're also, you also pull tight. You are also adding structure, of course, to this bit. You're also adding structure. But that's about it. So try to cover it up. Um, you, in this process, you will go around these stitches a couple of times. So this will also create a, well, form of a drawstring. So you can use this to tighten up. And once you are satisfied, you just uh, go uh, pull the yarn through to the other side and um, weave in the tail. Another thing you might notice, and you can see this here. So here we have an area where, well, uh, we have ladders here, that's what they are. So um, later on, you will have to um, manually adjust this. So uh, these stitches, um, stole yarn here from the adjacent stitches. So you will m have to manually, using a spare knitting needle, carry over the slack to the adjacent stitches because that's where they stole all this yarn from. They stole the yarn as the gaps were flapping around this way and that way. They stole the yarn, so you need to feed it back to either side. It's going to be a little bit tedious, but um, it's going to be worth it because it will help to make here this transition even neater. neater. Take 15 minutes or so and do this manually. Trust me, uh, it will be so worth it. And I'm going to do that. And of course, another thing. So this side here still looks a little bit, um, little bit wonky. So you would have to join in a new yarn on the wrong side. So just do as if you were, would weave in a yarn using a spare length of yarn. I'll show you quickly. So here's the little gap or what remains of the gap on the other side. So here, I don't know how well you can see, this is the armhole. So this is the inside of my armpit. So I just thread a spare length of yarn here on a tapestry needle and then I will act as if I want to weave in this yarn. So it's already kind of secure. I will leave a little tail and then you can pull this uh, yarn here through to the front and then fix things from there using duplicate stitch. Once you closed both armholes, you, well, maybe there are none left, but if there are some, you uh, need to weave in the remaining tails as well. Since by now you probably already know how to do that, I'll leave you to it. And then I'll show you how to block this sweater. Once you're satisfied, it's time to block your sweater. Just put it in lukewarm water and let it soak for half an hour or so. So as you can see, I added some uh, mild uh, wool detergent here. Um, this one is specifically made for yuck and cashmere and merino. And of course, this is yuck yarn. And I'm just gonna let this soak here for half an hour and then we're ready to block. And then gently press out the excess water and spread it out on a blocking mat. I make sure that all the knit stitches are neatly aligned, seamed, so my final stitch definition will be nice and neat. As you can see, I am using these cheap Becker rods from the hardware store and insert them here into my sleeves to avoid permanent uh, fold lines. You might also observe that I specifically don't stretch out the hem, just the actual body. I don't want to lose all stretchiness there. The very same applies to the collar. I try to avoid stretching out things too far. 
So, and now is the grand moment. You can finally put on your sweater and wear it with pride. Because proud you should be. Knitting a sweater like this one here is no easy feat and you managed it, unlike millions, no, in fact, billions of other people on this planet. So kindly do not overly focus on little mistakes or inconsistencies you might have added here and there. Chances are that nobody except you will be, or an expert knitter, will be able to um, notice them. And also do remember, you are no knitting machine and it's all these organic qualities that sets hand knitting apart. Now, if your sleeves are too long or your hem is too long, that's something you can still fix. Remember the lifeline I inserted at the beginning of this video? Well, cut open your cast on, unravel things to that point and then make things shorter or longer, whatever you need. Very important, this also remains an option. If after a month or so of wearing your sweater, you notice suddenly, well, it's a little bit too loose or you gain weight or lost weight, then insert an afterthought lifeline, cut open the cast on, unravel and make things shorter. Or maybe you need four small kids, they often grow super fast. You can always let things out. Either way, I really hope you enjoy knitting along with me. Feel free to comment on this video with your questions or suggestions anytime. Just comment below. Please also know that it took me well over a hundred hours to record and edit this video and knitting all the samples and I knitted more than just one comes on top of that. So kindly do not casually ask me to record another video like top down or seam sweater or cardigan or whatever. It's nothing I can do on a whim and it will certainly depend on the success of this video. So kindly support my work, comment this on this video, like this video and maybe even subscribe on my Patreon account. You'll find the link in the description below. Help me creating more videos like this one here for everyone. Anyway, happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.